Fanatics has the opportunity to revolutionize the hobby or they could really screw things up. Today, we're giving you the 12 things we think Fanatics needs to do to make the hobby 100 times better. My name is Jeff Wilson. By day, I invest in tech companies. And at night, I invest in sports cards. Join me and my team as we help you profit from the hobby we all love. Hello, sports card investors, and welcome to an extremely important episode because the conversation we're going to have today is everything for the future of the sports card hobby. We are going to talk about the things that we really, really, really want to see fanatics do because we think it's going to make a big difference for the hobby. And I'm joined by Tyler Nethercott, Teapot, our VP of Product Development here at Sports Card Investor. And I know what we're about to talk about is something that you're really, really passionate about. Yeah, this is something we've been talking about for a long time. Honestly, since the news of Fanatics taking over drop, even before that, when we were coming up with our wish list of things that we just wished to see from Panini and Topps, I always enjoy these conversations, but this is one that I am especially enthusiastic about. Yeah, and it's great timing because now that Fanatics is taking over, they acquire Tops at the beginning of the year. We know that they also will be getting the uh, NFL license and the NBA license in the years ahead, possibly earlier if they work something out with Panini. I don't know if that will happen or not. But what we do know is this is a big opportunity to hit the reset button. Fanatics is bringing in fresh thinking. They have the opportunity to kind of reset everything that's going on and say, how can we make this better? How can we make this stronger for the future? And there's 12 areas where we really want to see them hit that reset button and make some changes. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. And as we go through these, I also want to hear from you. I want to hear what are the things that you want Fanatics to change most about the hobby. Let us know in the comments. Hopefully Fanatics will read these comments and get some great market research and listen to your suggestions. I will say, so far, my interactions with Josh Luber, who's the head of Fanatics' new trading card venture, have been great. I've known Josh since his days at StockX. He seems very passionate and very committed to making changes, to make things better for the hobby. He is a passionate collector himself. And I really believe that a lot of the things we're gonna talk about today and a lot of your ideas are things that we will see go into action over the next couple of years. So I'm optimistic, I'm hopeful, and um, hopefully he and others at Fanatics listen to this list. And I would love nothing more than a few years from now to be able to look back at this video today and see a lot of these things in action. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get started. Yeah. Give me give me your first one, T-Pop. Okay, so my, one of my biggest ones, pack odds. Show the pack odds. Now, the good news here, they bought Tops. Tops shows pack odds. Tops actually shows pack odds still today. Panini, for whatever reason, does not. They're kind of veiling the numbers. We know that Luber talked about transparency overall. What he wants is to kind of have clear stated print runs. I don't know that I love the idea of knowing the print run on every card. I think that's actually potentially a really bad idea. Pack odds help though, and if they kind of take strike a balance between, okay, serial numbering or stated print runs on, on certain more rare cards, but then you show the pack odds on inserts, for example, that's what people love. That's what takes me back to the 90s when I was a kid, and you go, oh my gosh, I pulled a one in, in 356 pack you know, card. That's really exciting. The other thing that pack odds does that's really nice is it makes sure that there's a kind of an understood or perceived value or scarcity with a particular card. Right now you can pull an insert from like Panini Mosaic and you have no idea unless it's stated as a case hit how hard that card is to hit and it makes them really weird on the secondary market. Like people don't go after things that if you sit and watch box breaks a lot you realize that's wow that's actually kind of like a one in every other box card that somebody just hit but it you know it could be a curry that goes for like 20 bucks right. whereas some like you know, basic parallel from the base set that's far more common ends up going for more money than that card. So pack odds, really, really important. Now I think case hits in particular, they have their own mystique. People actually like that they don't know the specific odds of a case hit. 
I think they just kind of like to know, wow, this is really rare. Some people kind of try to project it. They put it on the forums. This is what I think. So keeping some of the mystique alive with cards, but having pack odds is really, really important to, to I think, the future of cards. Interesting. You know, and I'm going to say, I, I like more disclosure of print runs as well, but certainly pack odds at a minimum would get us a lot further in terms of transparency. A lot of this is about transparency, and that's one thing we're really hoping to see from Fanatics. So I'm gonna kind of build on that and say that I would like to see every set that is released have a defined audience and a defined purpose. I don't feel like we have that right now. I feel like with the current manufacturers, we have a lot of sets created just to create them, just because they can, especially quite honestly with Panini. I feel like that happens with a lot of different Panini sets. There's so many different sets. And it, I, I look at some of these sets and I'm like, who is the exact audience and what is the uniqueness of this set? What is the value that this set brings? I would really like to see future releases. It'd be very obvious. This set is created for investors. This set is created for people who want to invest significant money in a card, hold on to a card, hopefully see long-term appreciation of value. These sets are created for collectors. These sets are, they have uniquenesses to them that a collector is going to appreciate. We're not necessarily trying to preserve the secondary market value quite as much on these sets, but we're trying to give collectors some really cool elements like lots of insert cards and lots of things that collectors like to go after. I want to see sets that are low end, that are printed, that are printed more heavily. Um, and everyone knows they're printed more heavily. That's disclosed, but they also make it very affordable. I wanna see sets that are really created for kids, and these are your true entry level, the ones that are, are akin to the packs that you used to be able to buy when you were a kid for 99 cents down at the corner store. I wanna see those, but I want them designated as such so we know what we're getting into. I want that stratification of sets, and I also think each set should have its own uniqueness in terms of purchase or in terms of purpose. There, there can be certain sets that are the sets you go for because they've really they've got really great patches. They're known for their patches. And then if you have another set that's not known for its patches, don't attempt to put lame, you know, uh, you know, cloth napkin styles, you know, relics or swatches in there. Just don't bother to do it. If you know, have sets that are all about the parallels. Have sets that are all about the inserts, have sets that are all about the autographs, have sets that are all about the patches, but that's what that set is and that's what you're concentrated. I, I feel like that stratification of sets behind purpose, behind audience would really make a difference. Yeah, 100%. I agree with all of that completely. Yep. Yeah. What's next for you? So number two, and a little bit related to what you just said is parallels. Mm -hmm. We gotta talk about parallels, stop, death by parallels that's the first thing with parallels like we we've seen it we've done episodes on this we did did you know did panini destroy select and we've talked to josh about that and you know his thoughts on that episode and he had a lot of good insights in that now i think the exception like if you go back to the early years with panini i think like right in that 2013 2014 time frame when you had like 10 parallels that was ideal make it so that you have one one of one not yes two one of ones yes not five one of ones, yes. definitely not 35 one of ones. Yes. One one of ones, Ugh. so that it's truly a one of one. Not, you know, black, black pulsar, black disco, black everything, like just make a black parallel. And then in another product, maybe make the nebula parallel, like that's how you should do it. Uh, the exception here, you know, in terms of like limiting the number of parallels, would be the point you said, a specific product that is like a rainbow chase product. That could be a category, like a product tier that they have within Fanatics, within Tops, is like, this is the Rainbow Chase product that I'm gonna go after, you know, with 35 parallels and really go after that hunt, including the one, one of one. So I think that's really important. Um, the last thing, I just kind of like a unique idea, uh, is I think getting creative with parallels, people really love color matches. So imagine if there was like a super, super, super short printed, maybe it's numbered, maybe it's a case hit, whatever it is, color matched to the specific player to their jersey. Meaning, if LeBron's in a Lakers you know, uniform, it's a purple or a gold parallel. But if it's you know, somebody on the Pistons, it's blue or red, and it's really, you know, really, really well matched. That's what people are going after like crazy right now. But it gets weird when you're like, oh, I want a Pistons parallel that's color matched, but it's numbered to 299. Yeah, yeah. But if I want the LeBron with the Lakers, it's definitely to gold, and most people right. can't find or afford that. So 
try to figure out a way to balance that, but I think that'd just be a fun kind of mm. off the cuff, like the color match parallel, the jersey color match parallel mm. would be really cool. That's pretty cool. I like that idea. I hadn't thought about that one before. That would, by the way, if any of these ideas are resonating with you, let us know in the YouTube comments which ones are resonating the most. So I need to see the crazy discrepancy between wholesale pricing, retail pricing, and secondary market pricing shift. This has been a massive problem for the hobby. I mean, you guys know, you know how crazy it was to try to find products at retail the last couple of years about how people were literally camping out outside of Target stores and paying off stock boys at Walmart stores. Getting so in that, fights. Yeah, I mean, getting in fights, literally in fights. Yeah. And obviously, you know, they Target stopped selling cards for a while as a result of it. And, uh, and it was because the retail products, if you got your hands on one, you could then turn around and flip it on the secondary market for five times or six times what you paid for it the very next day. Even worse was the fact that the wholesalers who were distributing to hobby shops and retailers, they were hoarding product and then, and then marking, it up, marking it up far beyond what they should have been able to mark it up because they knew how valuable it was. They didn't want to turn it around and sell it at wholesale prices. They wanted to get markup you got hobby shops taking a lot of markup in some cases, in other cases very little because of what they're getting it through from wholesalers and they can't get enough allocation. The whole system right now is a mess. It is not healthy for those who want to be able to go buy cards at retail, for those who want to be able to pay a reasonable price for cards. It's also not healthy. The, the whole, the way the secondary market's been, you know, it goes up and then it can crash. None of that is healthy. We've got to have the entire distribution system at fair market pricing throughout. I do think that's something that Fanatics will change. Of course, Fanatics will go, a lot of what they're gonna do is gonna be direct to consumer, but they're not gonna totally cut out, you know, the idea of going through retailers and that type of thing either. So when they do, it's really important that that pricing be fair and with a secondary market in mind the whole way through. Yep. Well said. There you go. Three. What you got next? Uh, number, number three for me, Inserts, make inserts great again. Like inserts, this is one area where Panini has really beaten out Tops pretty badly. Tops does fantastic with their photography. I mean, fantastic. Their insert game is weak right. in general. Like we did the insert March Madness two years ago, and it was just Panini. Yeah, all, all the, the way Panini stuff. The sure, Elite your eight, like kabooms and your color blasts everything. and I your mean, blank slates yeah. and all that stuff yeah. was was way you know yeah. way, blowing out the the tops. Yep. Inserts. So, yeah. the, so the, the yin to the yang of reducing the number of parallels is upping your insert game, right? Yeah. Making better inserts. That was the, that's the huge piece from the 90s. Take, go back and throw back, and I know Josh is big on those cards. Look at Fleer, look at what Panini has done in the last era. If you're gonna make a die cut, make the die cut meaningful. Uh, typically make the die cut so that the bottom still sits flat in a top loader and doesn't shift to the side. Laser cut cards are really cool, you know, if, if those are well done, and that's something I don't see as much now. Um, but just inserts in general, creativity, it, maybe even, you know, listening, like there's so many uh, custom card accounts now mm -hmm. on Instagram, people making custom cards. Gosh, there's gotta be something in there for a lot of, uh, you know, creative idea generation, or even potentially a, almost like a, pro you know, Project 2020 art collaboration with some of these custom card creators, but make inserts great again. And then, like you said, stratify them in terms of pack odds. And the coolest ones should be the hardest ones to get. It's, it shouldn't be too much of rocket science, but we all love inserts. We should, we should bring them back in a big time way. I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, building on my last comment about selling products at fair prices, I love the blind Dutch auction system that Josh Luber is a big proponent of. They tested that a couple of years ago at StockX with Bowman Chrome X, it was a special release, and they sold it via this blind Dutch auction. And I did a whole video about it at the time because I saw it and I said, this should be the way that all high-end sports cards, all investment caliber sports cards are sold. And I, I think Fanatics is gonna put that into play. Zero Cool, their first attempt at trading cards, the VFriends set, all sold through blind Dutch auction. I'm very passionate about that being the most fair way for cards to be sold upon initial release for high-end investment cards. Now, I still think 
that there need to be certain sets that go to hobby shops, certain sets that go to retail, certain sets that are available for kids, certain sets that have high print runs that are not sold that way. But for your high-end product, what would be the equivalent of you know, a National Treasures or a Flawless, those types of products, we need to sell those exclusively, in my opinion, by Blind Dutch Auction. And if you're not really familiar with Blind Dutch Auction, this, by the way, is not the same system Panini is using right now. This is a much more equitable system, much more fair to the investor and the collector. If you're not familiar with it, we've done videos on it. I've also talked to Josh Luber about it on Instagram quite a bit. Uh, it's the future. I want to see a lot of it. There's probably even a way they could do that with still releasing product to a hobby shop, but having the IPO via the Blind Dutch auction before the hobby shops are allowed to release it for sale. Interesting. You know, so like, maybe they release it at the same price point yeah, or something yeah, of that nature? Yeah, so you know, maybe, maybe Fanatics, based on market research and just a general understanding of established products, okay, we know it's gonna go for at least this. Yeah. So that we're not gonna like hose the hobby shops. We, or maybe they say, you know, hobby shops, we're gonna commit, allocate this much product to you at this wholesale discount based on what the IPO is, right? So that we yeah. can still distribute to you you can get some direct to consumer who can kind of go after it and set the bar that way. That could be a, a really unique way to do it as interesting, well. Interesting, interesting. All right, we'll talk, we'll talk more about that in a minute. What you got next? <laughs> All right, so uh, kind of similar, following a similar theme here. Relics, patches, jerseys. There is a movement, an important movement, a hashtag movement on Instagram. Say no to player worn. I am a big proponent of that hashtag, and I think that we should completely get rid of player-worn memorabilia. Even in lower-end sets for kids, I think maybe you can make a case for it there, but I just think it's like, it's a false friend. It's a false friend that people don't really want, and unfortunately what it has done is it has completely cheapened game-worn relics. Right. It has completely cheapened it because people don't know the difference and many times you can't see from the front of the card is it player worn or game worn people on ebay taking one photo <clears throat> make relics great again as well you know release them and then i would say and you so you want them all game worn you I want, want them all only game -worn. only yeah. pieces of jerseys that yeah. were actually used in a game correct. Okay. correct and then if you get a single color napkin style jersey piece but it's game worn mm -hmm that's at least still somewhat meaningful, right? It still has some value. Or in the early days of the first jersey pieces and cards, many of them were that. Yeah, they were. And they're highly sought after because they were the early years. You get a Jordan single color, nobody cares. It's a Jordan piece of game-worn jersey. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important. Second thing that's really cool, doesn't have to be for all game-worn, but game-dated. There's a really cool set. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's many sets that have done this, but like 2014 Court Kings, yeah. performance art. Yep. Really cool set. Many of them are multicolor patches. You flip the card over and it says, Kevin Durant played in this game against mm -hmm. this opponent. He dropped 37 points and did X, Y, Z in that jersey, right? Like in that piece of jersey, really, really cool. And then I think this is really important and it, it's just a huge pet peeve of mine. Ensure that the more rare the card is, so the lower the serial number is on the card, the better the patch quality sure. is, right? Yep. I've seen situations where people pull a numbered to 100 or numbered to 99 patch and it's like two or three colors mm -hmm. and they get the number to 49 and it's just a single color napkin of the same exact card. It's, that's really bizarre to me. So I just think intentionality around it, game worn, game dated, all really, really well, And it goes things. without saying, I mean, recently this last year or two, we've now seen, uh, you know, uh, swatches and, and that type of thing that's literally say on the card, this is not associated with any player, Anything. event, yeah you know, anything, like it's not even player worn, yeah. like that's a whole nother level of just get that out of the hobby, right? Yeah. I just, yeah. I just, I'm not a fan of it. I think it's misleading. Yeah, totally agree. Well, a minute ago, I talked about Dutch auctions and the retail market and the secondary market, and you mentioned hobby shops. So my next thing is make hobby shops even better. Hobby shops are the experience. They are the physical experience by which people can go in and experience cards. Hobby shops and card shows are that, right? And I know Fanatics is gonna do a lot of direct-to-consumer stuff, a lot of online sales, and I think that that's fine with certain products. But I think we need to recognize how critically important hobby shops are to the sports card ecosystem and to the growth of sports cards because they allow that community, that local community to build around sports cards. And it's critical that Fanatics does everything they can to support local hobby shops. 
One way that I would really like to see them support them is by having hobby shop specific products that are only available in hobby shops, that are not available anywhere else, not online at places that don't have uh, physical hobby shops that are only available in hobby shops. And you know, there are right now, you might say, well, there's, there's plenty of hobby products. There's Panini has hobby products, Topps has hobby products. But the distribution of those has kind of become so wide that breakers break hobby products, online retailers sell hobby products. I actually want actual hobby shop. Like you've got to physically walk into the hobby shop to get this particular release product. I want a whole series of those. I think that would really help boost hobby shops. It would create a lot of excitement on release day with, because people can only get it by physically going into the hobby shop. Don't even make them available online. You gotta physically go in. That would really boost the hobby shop and it would create a great environment on those days. If a big new product came out once a month that was a hobby shop only product and was available Saturdays in hobby shops across the country, It'd be so much fun. You'd have lines forming outside. They'd have a party that day. People would be ripping the boxes in the shop, in the parking lot. Support hobby shops. Yep, 100%. Yeah. Cool, awesome. what you got next? All right, uh, my fifth one, similar again. Autographs. Yes. Right? This is a big one. Yes. Autographs. I'm not gonna say eliminate sticker autos, and I'm not gonna say that for a reason because some players, especially in, in sports like soccer, it's very hard to get on-card autos from players distributed all throughout the world, but reduce sticker autos. Reduce them significantly. Like we should not see these videos on card porn or some other, you know, Instagram account of somebody with a stack of sticker autos like mm -hmm. this, just like wasting their life away doing a scribble. Like doing a scribble because they have so many sticker, you know, stickers to sign, labels to sign. And similar to that then is better auto quality. Now, you can only do so much and I know this, this gets into a separate conversation that we won't get into about redemptions, which I think they have to figure out too. But when it comes to these autos, like somehow trying to craft a narrative for these young athletes, have a decent auto, have a halfway decent auto, or in the very least, have a better auto on the higher end product so that if you pull an NT or a flawless type card, you know, out of Fanatics, it's not just like, get it, you know, a little tiny scribble and you're like, well, that was, what is that? I don't even know who, if I looked at that auto, I have no idea who this is. Mm. So you go back to these old guys and you look at their autos and Dikembe Mutombo's got this epic, huge signature with his card number and everything. That's the type of thing you wanna see in an autograph. So if they can encourage that, entice that, incentivize that somehow, that would be much better. I think we'd all much rather say, hey, new first round draft pick, you only have to sign one eighth of the number of autos you used to, so make it count. That'd be a lot better for the hobby. And then I had a friend, you know, I kind of asked some people, what if, you know, over the uh, the weeks, what do you want to see from Fanatics? And a friend had a kind of a off the cuff, like more unique idea. People really like seeing those videos of the athletes signing the cards, you know, on online. What if you had like a redemption on the back of the card to an NFT? video clip of them signing that specific card so that you can you can really track the provenance literally from the time that card was raw and unsigned to when the autograph hit it and now you own the card in the moment and that kind of gets digitized together i think would be really cool i like it i like it i like it these are some good ideas which which ones do you guys like the most let us know in the comments and build on these ideas if you guys have uh additions to them we're down to our last couple um so you know being a, being a sports card investor one thing that's very important to me is secondary market value of cards. I don't know the exact way that Fanatics can help better support it. Right now, we see troubling things like uh, the you know the price of wax is is so high. You bust it open, almost always the cards are worth a lot less. We see that when new sets come out and the wax is opened. Uh, that the first cards that sell, you know, sell for a lot, and then every day that goes by, they sell for less and less, and the people who buy those cards early often take a complete bath. Yeah. You know, Fanatics can only do so much to control that, and I get that, and some of this could be solved via their blind Dutch auctions and all that type of thing, but my request of Fanatics would be to pay attention to the secondary market, monitor the secondary market, place value on what's happening in the secondary market. Because ultimately, if Fanatics wants their product releases to be strong, if they want there to be 
fever around every single one of their product releases and people lining up to get them, then they have to preserve the secondary market. The secondary market has to be strong in order for that passion around the original releases to continue. And unfortunately now, some of the things we're seeing with these gigantic print runs that have happened with certain products over the last couple of years, you know, we're seeing the secondary market just crater on a lot of cards that have come out of, of releases over the last couple of years where people thought they were gonna hold up stronger than they have. Um, you know, print runs weren't disclosed. We're now seeing just, you know, floods of cards on the market. So watch, monitor, and preserve the secondary market. There's always gonna be an organic evolution of card price values mm -hmm. based on player performance, but also just based on sudden uptick in popularity of an insert or a parallel or something like that, right? But I do think you're onto something in terms of, you know, with the blind Dutch auction, coupled with the stated print runs, there's some basic math that can be done on that, right? Oh, this is how many of these cards exist. This is what the IPO was on the wax product. Using that math, going back to the early Beckett years, you know, going back to their price guide, you had like, here's the star price, here's the multiplier for superstar, here's the multiplier for the top player in the league, the MVP. And they can kind of meet that out, right? They can kind of like evaluate, at least initially. We're not telling you this is what it's worth. We're saying based on this other math, this would be almost like an, a secondary market SRP initially for these cards that you just, you go into it with a realistic expectation. I'm not getting crushed. Then the secondary market, it's still gonna set those prices no matter what. But I think a little more transparency into some of that kind of pricing analytic type stuff would be really valuable too. Totally agree, totally agree. All right, we're down to our last two. Your last one and my last one, Teapot, what is your final wish for Fanatics? Yeah, my final wish is just listen to the hobby. So mm -hmm. we're making this video and I know that Josh has said they do follow a lot of this content and they, they read comments and things like that. I think just listen to the hobby. Keep a pulse on the hobby. It's, it's the heartbeat, the people. Now there's a lot of opinions and a lot of conflicting opinions. We're gonna make this video and we're gonna hear a lot of them in the comments, but uh, in general, getting that feedback, doing market research, you know, bringing in people, they, they, they've given Josh a very unique role and title with Fanatics. And that, that to me is like a really good indication. Now you have kind of this strategic army of people, hopefully that he's networked with over the years and will continue to network with, that he can listen to and get really good feedback. And you know what? If you have a release and the feedback is, this product is trash or we really don't like it or whatever, just, you know, you can kind of respond to that. Like, you know, you can kind of say, okay, we, we heard what you, you know, said. Maybe it's later, maybe you sunset the product, but you acknowledge like, hey, we're trying new things, we're gonna innovate. Uh, but I think, uh, I think just listening in general is really important. Yeah, and I'm gonna build on that. My final thing, and I, this is gonna sound selfish, but I'm being selfish for you. Give us access, and not just us, but give other content creators access. Be transparent, open up the veil, show us what's going on. <laughs> and I say this, you know, we have, we have we have asked Panini, for example, for many, many times over the last year, let us come do a behind the scenes tour. Let us come talk to your design team and understand how products are designed. Let us come capture the, you know, the, the production process or capture that design process or just you know, let us come and create content because you out there want to see it. You want to see behind the scenes. You want to understand what it is like. When we went and did a behind the scenes video at SGC grading last year, that became one of the most popular videos in this channel's history. And it also, by the way, became a huge boom in business for SGC. SGC says that that video was very transformative in how their perception was, under, how they were perceived by the public because it was the first time that a grading company had ever lifted the veil and let you see you know, behind the scenes and what was going on. Fanatics should do the same. Let us come with our cameras. Let other content creators come. Let us see what's happening. Be transparent and, and send us new releases. Let us show them. Let us talk about them. Let us review them honestly. That's something that we also haven't unfortunately been able to get the current card manufacturers to do all the time. And Topps does send us some product and we appreciate it. Not always the new stuff, you know, not consistently. We would love more access because if we get more access, it gives you more access. And again, not just us, all content creators, we wanna be fair about it, but access is important because it lifts the veil, it makes it transparent, and it connects 
everything that is going on in the hobby and it lets us see what is happening. So that is something that I really hope Fanatics does as well. Yes, I love it. All right, man, this has been weird. You can tell guys, we're passionate about this. If you are in sports cards for the long term, I know you are passionate about this topic as well and we would love to hear from you in the comments. We appreciate you guys watching today. And I gotta give you a little plug at the end. I'm gonna give a plug for our Sports Card Investor app because one thing that we are going to both be committed in doing is as soon as we start getting these Fanatics releases, they're immediately going into the Sports Card Investor app. We now have almost 600,000 cards in the Sports Card Investor app that you can go in there and search for and track and see what they're selling for and buy them right through the app. And by the way, the app is totally free. Get it on your phone, the Sports Card Investor app in the App Store. And if you have it on your phone, you just haven't opened it up in a while, open it up today. Try the new shuffle mode. It's pretty cool, that little shuffle button in the top menu bar. Teapot, this has been great. Appreciate you coming on and having this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really excited about this Fanatic stuff. I'm excited to see what Panini can continue to do too, as well as Upper Deck. Uh, I think it's really a bright future and hopefully they'll watch this too. You know, that wasn't just for Fanatics. It's fun to talk about it, but I uh, would love to see some of these changes from the other guys too. Absolutely, 100%. If you enjoyed this content, please give this video a like, hit that subscribe button, hit that little bell icon so we can continue to bring you new videos like this and leave us a comment with your own thoughts. Thanks everybody. We will see you back soon with our next episode.